the number one thing is to make the diagnosis, meaning to look at the complex symptoms that you or a loved one or friend has and go, oh, did we ever think about mold toxicity as the cause? Because it is missed so often. There are so many suffering people in this country who could be helped if they knew what was wrong with them. So if you have a weird, wild collection of symptoms that make no sense, even to doctors that you've been to, think mold. We are excited to share this conversation with Dr. Neil Nathan that will shed light on a topic that needs much more awareness amongst both patients and practitioners, and that is mold and mycotoxin illness. Dr. Nathan is a leading expert on mold and mycotoxins who over the past 50 plus years of his practice helped to diagnose and treat patients who had not been helped by conventional medicine. He is an author of several books, including his instant classic book, Toxic, Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivities, and Chronic Environmental Illness. This is a book we regularly refer to here at our clinic, Capital Integrative Health. My name is Dr. Andrew Wong, co-founder of Capital Integrative Health. This is a podcast dedicated to transforming the consciousness around what it means to be healthy and understanding the root causes of both disease and wellness. And mold is one of the huge under-recognized root causes of disease. For those who have suffered from symptoms such as chronic fatigue, cognitive impairment, chronic sinus symptoms, digestive issues, and joint pain without finding answers, today's conversation with Dr. Neil Nathan is one you don't want to miss. Welcome, Dr. Nathan, to our podcast. Thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, thank you for having me. So we've been in practice for a number of years now, and um, one of the things that we've learned a lot is, about is mold and mycotoxins. And you know, a lot of what we do is you know deal with people with chronic illness or you know chronic health concerns. I would say, and over the years, what I've learned is that you know mold and mycotoxins can play a key role in some of their you know health issues, and it might be the barrier or the you know barriers, I should say, to to, you know, health and healing and wellness. Um, so that's kind of our topic for today, but just to get a little bit uh, more into, into kind of your uh, story, which I know we usually like to ask people that first as an opening question, Dr. Nathan, if you could tell us kind of more about what drew you to integrative health, you know, after starting your path in medicine. Well, I think that starts in medical school where I was one of those really annoying medical students who kept asking my professors, well, why do you do it that way? I mean, what, what is the rationale behind doing this and not doing this? And so my medical professors either loved me or hated me. <laughs> I, I was nobody in between. But I, I kept feeling, even in medical school, that there was a great deal missing in my education, but I couldn't put my finger on it. And I kept saying, we're missing something here. And my professors would say, well, okay, wise guy, if you're so smart, tell us what we're missing. And I, I was too green to know. But within a few years of leaving medical school, it became clear to me, I, I had language for it. It was that we were not including the spiritual and energetic and emotional components of health with the physical components. So I learned to be a medical technician, but that's not what I wanted out of medical school. Um, I wanted to be a healer. And I was very disappointed that that was not part of the curriculum. So, you know, when you leave medical school, some people think, okay, I've learned everything I need to know. And, and I left medical school with gosh, I have a whole lot more I've got to learn here. I've got to study from anybody who has some answers for me. So I, I spent the next 50 years, literally, um, studying with people in virtually every field you might imagine who had answers. Some of my studies, I wasted time, energy, and money. And some of my studies were like, wow, this is important. This is a very important component to healing. So that's kind of the short answer of how I got into integrative medicine, because as a field, it 
began to address the needs that I had to be the best healer that I knew how to be, to meet my patient's needs in a much more profound level. Yeah, it sounds like it's patient driven and and you're really an integrative medical practitioner before the term got got popularized, yeah. <laughs> uh, I was practicing holistic medicine before that was a word. Yes, yes, exactly. Holistic, integrative, and functional, it's kind of evolved over time. Well, today we want to talk about mold and mycotoxin and the role in both health and illness. And for listeners who may not be familiar, we'll start with the basics. Um, what is mold? You know, what is mycotoxins and mold toxicity? If you could just kind of touch on that briefly. Well, sure. I think everybody knows what mold is. It's that green stuff that grows on your food when you leave it in the refrigerator for too long um, or on your windowsill or unfortunately um, in your house on the wall or the ceiling or any place. So I mean, mold is a fungal organism which has the capacity to make a toxic substance called a mycotoxin which is a fancy medical word for mold toxin. Now, it doesn't make mycotoxin to make us sick. It makes these toxins to keep other molds out of this ecosystem. So I'm talking to you now from Northern California, where I live, and right out my window is a redwood forest. And in that redwood forest, there are probably a thousand species of mold. Um, most of them are not toxic to humans, and most of them are making toxins to keep other molds out of their ecological niche. So we have molds that prefer redwood trees and tan oaks and azaleas and rhododendrons. And so every, every little uh, vegetation has its own preference. So the molds make these toxins to keep others away. When they get into a water damaged building, they begin to make toxins that really will affect us if they are a toxic mold species. And what we've learned, and this is a, a huge missing piece in medical education, what we've learned is that this is really common for people to be affected by mold toxins. It's estimated that 10 million Americans currently are struggling with some degree of mold toxicity, and the vast majority have no idea that that's what's going on. It's like, well, big deal. So I see a little bit of mold in my bathroom. If you're genetically predisposed, that could be profoundly affecting your health. And we're just beginning to not only learn about it, but also learn how to treat it and diagnose it. That's a huge number of people. And 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 would you say that clinicians, how trained our clinicians are on, on you know, recognizing, um, let alone treating mold-related illness? Very poorly. Um, many doctors not only are not aware of it, but fight the concept of it. <laughs> and my favorite answer from doctors when I talk to them about this is they'll tell me, well, if what you're saying is true, they should have taught me this in medical school. And I go, what? You're, you're telling me that they should have taught you something in medical school that we didn't know about back then, because that's why you don't know about it and refuse to accept it. For me, that's like a crazy argument. It's like make no sense at all. But you, you can't believe how often I hear that, which is if this, if this was really true, someone who would have taught me already. Yeah, it's about keeping an open mind and, you know, science advances and even the things that we find we have found to be true, you know, five years later, half of them are not true. So I mean, that's actually something my dean told me. And that was really nice to hear on day one of medical school. You know, it's like, oh, you want to learn this and you want to learn it well, but then keep an open mind because things might change over time or new discoveries. But, you know, mold has been around for forever, you know, so it's just that we, you know, humans are starting to really discover that it's really important to look at this sometimes for, for health and disease. How does mold toxicity affect our our body as a whole, I think maybe getting into some of the, the different symptoms or conditions that might be connected, which might be a, a huge list, of course. But I think just to give the listeners an overview of exactly how how um, how pervasive this could be affecting you know, people's body, mind, spirit. Sure, let me give it to you in two segments. 
First, let me give you an overview of symptoms, and then let me focus on a few symptoms that are really, really specific for mold, so people can begin to look at that. The big thing is that mold toxins create an inflammatory reaction in the entire body and can affect every organ system of the body by inflaming it. And of course, we are all biochemically and genetically unique. So not everyone will have the same presentation or the same symptoms. If you have a propensity for weakness in your lungs, you'll have lung-based symptoms. If it's in your joints, you'll have joint-based symptoms. Um, I mean, that's how it goes. So every organ system can be involved. There are general symptoms like fatigue, uh, cognitive impairment, like brain fog, difficulties with focus, memory and concentration, weakness. Those are kind of general, like a lot of things will do that. And then we have specific organ systems like lungs. So it can cause bronchospasm or an asthma-like condition. It can cause shortness of breath, air hunger, uh, wheezing, any of the above. It can cause joint or muscle pain in any joints of the body, and it can shift and move around. Um, it can cause neurological symptoms like numbness and tingling in different parts of the body. Uh, a wide variety of other neurological symptoms, which we call peripheral neuropathy. It can cause every type of gastrointestinal system possible, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, cramping, abdominal pain. Um, so it can cause urinary tract symptoms. It can cause pelvic pain, bladder symptoms. So uh, uh, floaters in the eyes, it can cause visual disturbance and sinus difficulties of every type. Um, so and that's only a part of it. So basically, often, if a physician doesn't know anything about it, a patient will come in complaining of multi-systemic issues, like I've got this doc and I've got this and I've got this and I've got this. And then a doctor who doesn't understand it will go, oh, it's gotta be in your head because nothing could do all of that. And the right. answer is, oh yes. There are quite a few things that will cause this type of inflammation. Mold is only one of them. There are many infectious illnesses. Uh, most prominent being Lyme with its co-infections, uh, but chlamydia um, infections and mycoplasma infections and some viral infections will do it. So when if physicians don't understand this inflammatory process, then they will be left with, well, I don't, I don't know what's causing that, so it must be in your head. And that's unfortunately how a lot of these patients have been treated. Yes, and then, oh, go ahead. So now I'm gonna to shift to the more specific symptoms. So particular types of pain, if a patient complains of electrical pains or ice pick type pains, that's pretty much mold. If they have a perception of an internal vibration in their body, can't be seen, but they can feel it, and it's very annoying. That's that's mold or Bartonella. If they have what a specialist will diagnose as an atypical fill in the blank, atypical rheumatoid arthritis, atypical MS, atypical Alzheimer's, atypical Parkinson's. The word atypical means it kind of looks like this to me as a specialist, but it doesn't really fit. If you've been given that word atypical in your diagnosis, think mold, think Lyme. And then we have every type of psychological process because mold can affect the limbic system and the vagal nerve in such a way that it will affect people's emotions profoundly. So people who have never before been anxious or depressed or had OCD now have profound anxiety, which comes out of the blue or intense depression or OCD behaviors, or it can worsen any psychological issue before. So these are things that you might particularly look at if you've been working with a physician, not getting the help you need, not really being diagnosed. If you've got any of that, start thinking about mold. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. I do have a follow-up question to that comment about how mold can cause anxiety, depression, OCD. Are you 
saying that it can cause an inflammation in the brain, which is then imbalancing yes, the system. Yes, I, I am saying that. Um, there's a type of MRI um, in which we can quantify the parts of the brain volumetrically um, called um, a quantum um, MRI uh, or a neuroquant. And you can see in the brains of mold patients areas of the brain that are either swollen or shrunken. And when we treat it, those come back to normal. So yes, there are specific things that we can see in which the brain, areas of the brain are definitely being affected by this inflammatory process. Got it, thank you. Um, now, I think let's talk about how mold exposure, if it's current or, or past, you know, um, how that might affect the person. So does mold exposure have to be current for it to impact someone or can past mold exposures impact someone's health? Both. So uh, it's more obvious if you are living in a moldy environment and you smell it and you see it and you have these symptoms and you're lucky enough to find a physician who understands what we're looking at here, uh, then it's slam dunk obvious. Okay. More confusing is that a lot of patients had mold exposure in the past. Could be as long as 20 years ago. And the mold actually colonizes, which means it starts growing in the body, usually in the sinus or gut areas, or often both. Now, if the immune system remains intact and strong, you can, you can kind of fend off those effects for a long time. But if your body takes a hit, uh, it could be intense stress, it could be a cold. COVID is a big one, which triggered it for a lot of patients. Any type of inflammatory or infectious process that goes on in the body could be surgery, could be childbirth, anything in which the immune system takes a hit and loses containment, then that mold starts to grow and make toxins at a rate in which you can no longer cope with it. So for example, um, Dr. Joe Brewer, back in 2013, wrote one of the first papers to help us to understand it. He took 112 patients with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, and he measured urine mycotoxins. And to his shock, 92% of them had mycotoxins in their urine. So then he treated them, and he wrote a series of two papers of 100 patients each in two different groups, showing that you could cure those conditions but the thing that got his attention was that when he asked patients, seeing all of this mycotoxin in the urine, he went, is there mold in your current living environment? And, and he went after it and went, for a lot of those patients, the answer was no. Well, when were you exposed? And he would get two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it's still in their bodies. So the answer is you're not truly safe if you have a brand new home and it's perfectly made and I can't have mold toxicity. I mean, you've probably seen this, Andrew, when patients come in and I ask them, have you been exposed to mold? And they say, nah, and I'll go, okay, um, think about it. Invariably, they come back at their next visit and go, you know, I lived in a, in a basement when I was a student at the university, and there was actually black stuff growing on the walls and any number of stories of that same nature. So yes, and this is kind of an upsetting thing for people. It could have been something you were exposed to years ago. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And, and, and being a detective like that, you know, sometimes we can kind of look at, oh, what, what happened in the past year, or the past two years, but 20 years, that's, that's a pretty long window to, you know, go back to. Um, in terms of testing, I think let's get into that, because we can look at, you know, um, how to get to, like you said, referenced about the root cause, you know, if someone has, say, a past mold uh, exposure or, or a current one, and, and we're trying to figure out how that might be affecting that person, what are the, what are the tests? Uh, I do want to get into some, some general um, ideas about how to address this too, but first testing, I would say, would be 
one thing to look at. What are your kind of your favorite tests? If you could just give our audience a bit of an overview of, of that. Sure. Uh, the easiest way to do this, and it's very simple, is simply to collect first morning urine and you send it into a lab and they will analyze it for a variety of mold toxins, which we call mycotoxins. Simple test, very easily done. Um, and here's the deal. If there is a great deal of mold toxins in your urine, meaning it's, it's in your body, it's not a maybe, it isn't, hmm, that's interesting. The next question would of course be, okay, when did I get it and how? So there are a number of laboratories that do the tests. And for your audience, I have no financial ties to any laboratory or any supplement company or any uh, uh, company that we bring up during this discussion. I have, I have none. So I do have a bias having done thousands of these tests on a lot of patients. The, I think that the real-time company does the best job at analyzing the urine and the best job at follow-up testing. We also get some decent information from the Great Plains Lab. We can get some information from Vibrant Health. And there's a blood test available for antibodies available from a lab called MyMyco. Um, again, having done all of these tests on some patients to be able to compare the accuracy, real time seems to be the best. And and Dr. Nathan, are you, I know we talked about this on email, but are you um, advising your patients to um, pre-treat with glutathione to help with, with kind of that urinary mycotoxin excretion? Right. One of the things that mold toxins do is they poison the body because they're poisons. And particularly, they interfere with the body's ability to detoxify. To translate that into English, you could have a boatload of toxin in your body, but you might not be able to get it out of your body through the urine because it's poison. So in order to get a better test, we will use sweating, which helps toxins to be mobilized, and glutathione. So an ideal test, if a patient can do it, not all people can take glutathione, um, but if you can, we like them to take glutathione for several days to a week before they collect their urine and to do a sauna or a hot bath or a hot tub the night before they collect the urine. So we'll get a more accurate assay. Great. And then let's say that someone does have a uh, urine mycotoxin test that comes back positive. Like you said, there's probably some current or past exposure going on. Where do you go from there? Because at that point, you know, in the conventional world, there's probably not necessarily a lot to do there from a, you know, from a conventional perspective, but certainly from an integrated perspective, what are kind of your general things you think about for detoxification of those uh, mycotoxins? Well, I think there are three main things that we first need to, to conceptualize it. First, we need to know where the toxin is coming from. Is it old or is it current? The reason we need to know that is that you can't get well if you are living in a moldy environment or working in a moldy environment. You just can't. You get a little bit better, but you cannot get well. So we have to start by evaluating that patient's environment, home and work particularly, for uh, am I getting exposed to toxin where I live? If you're not, fabulous. We can jump right in and treat you. But if you are, we can still jump in and start treating you. But we're not going to make much progress until you either remediate where you're living or working or move. And there's, it's very difficult. This is very financially difficult for a lot of people to even think about. But it's step one. Without doing that, we're never going to get well. I will use a water analogy here, which I think is appropriate for mold. If if, if we have a dam and the hole is, is still there and not prepared, then we can we can try to put the water out, but it'll still be leaking. It'll still kind of go in there. Yeah. The, the, the next two pieces are, we get some really wonderful information from our urine mold test. It tells us exactly which mycotoxins are present 
So then I know how I can bind those toxins to pull them out of the body because all of the mycotoxins are biochemically different. You can't, it's not like there is one thing that I can give you to pull that toxin out. We have to use a number of different binders to pull those toxins out. So I have a blueprint with my test results. Okay, you've got okra toxin. I know that I can use either cholesterol or Wellcol, which are medications, or activated charcoal to start pulling that out. If you have gliotoxin, uh, you can use bentonite clay and Saccharomyces boulardii. I mean, you don't have to know the details. If someone is interested, um, my book, Toxic, lays it out as to exactly which and exactly how if someone's interested in doing it. And that. that's an amazing book. We will remind people at the end of this too, but um, mm -hmm. that's definitely used as a touchstone for all of us here in our practice. So we, we really love that book. Thank you for writing it. Uh, thank you. Um, so we will then use the binders that we need to get start the process of pulling toxins out. And then because the majority of our patients have colonized, we then have to use antifungals both as a nasal spray for the sinuses or orally for the gut to start killing the mold and candida that's there. And with the binders on board, we'll be pulling all of that out of the body. That's the basic process. So you're doing the binders first to kind of get the detox system moving before you start to right, introduce yeah. more waste products into the system with the antifungals. That makes a lot of and, sense. Uh, always. And I want to emphasize it. You should not be using antifungals until the binders are on board. Otherwise, you risk what we call a die-off. All antifungals work by punching holes in the cell wall of a fungus so that it kills it. On the other hand, it, with a hole punched in it, its contents leak out, which include mycotoxins. So if you want to flood the body with mycotoxins and you don't have binders on board, you're really risking what we call a die-off reaction, which <laughs> any patients who had it would say, we definitely don't want to be doing that. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any um, general protocol for the number of weeks or how long you might put someone on binders before you're getting into, into some of the antifungal treatments? I want to have all of the binders that bind the toxins that are on that lab report on board yeah. within a week. As soon as all of them are on board, well, within a week, now we can start antifungals. But we do have to have the binders on board. And that makes sense. Um, and then I think on the nutritional side, any any sort of dietary recommendations you think about for people with mycotoxins? Yeah, very much. So think of the fact that for the majority of our patients, they are growing uh, candida and mold in their body. We don't want to feed it. What do they like to eat? Carbs. Sugar is its favorite, fruit second, but any carb will do. So basically you want a high protein, low carb diet. And these days, most of my patients prefer what we call the autoimmune paleo type diet because it's quite anti-inflammatory in nature. Given that we're working with an inflammatory process, that's very, very helpful in the healing process. Makes a lot of sense. I do have to ask the mushroom question. So shiitake mushrooms, enoki, et cetera, where are you with mushrooms and all this? You know, um, a lot of the information that people go on is old, meaning uh, when Oren Truss first started writing about candida, he was under the impression that any, any yeast in any form that was ingested was candida. Well, that's not really true. You're not really ingesting candida when you ingest yeast. So you'll see in a number of diet regimens, avoiding mushrooms, vinegar, fermented foods, and things of that nature. I don't think that's necessary, and I haven't done that for years. Yeah. So mushrooms have healing properties of their own. Some of the mushrooms you mentioned are excellent for helping the immune system to heal. I don't think they have to be avoided because I don't, they don't contain candida per se. So I think there's been a confusion about lumping candida with yeast 
and the so-called um, anti-candida diets, I don't, they're a little bit too stringent and probably not necessary. I'm glad you said that. That was the answer I was looking for. I made my day on that. Thank you so much. Um, but and yeah, because I, I, my... again, that's just my opinion. <laughs> yes. There are people who disagree with me. Right, right. No, got it. Got it. Yes. Not everything is all black and white, right? Um, especially in the integrated world and, and probably in the conventional world too, even though sometimes it's um, often I, I, written that I, way. I used to joke that if you can get two doctors to agree on anything, that's as close to truth as you're going to get. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and then you mentioned in the beginning about how not only the body, but also the mind and spirit can be affected and, and addressing that can also be effective in, in treating mycotoxins. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on integrated modalities that address mind, body, and spirit. What are your kind of favorites for, you know, helping someone with chronic illness in general, or maybe would say mold toxicity? Well, let me get specific here. Um, mold toxin specifically affects three other systems which have profound effects on the body. And if we don't treat them early, patients often can't get better. Those three systems are the limbic system, the vagus system, and mast cell activation. So to, to be really specific about answering your question, the limbic system is the part of the brain that monitors, regulates, and controls emotion and sensitivity. So having mold toxicity, I had mentioned that you can get intense anxiety or depression or OCD, or it can worsen any underlying psychological. The limbic system is being affected from the moment we're born by all of the traumas and stresses that we experience. So that if you have a perfect idealized childhood, which very few people do, maybe nobody, um, that's great. Your limbic system will be robust and healthy and not prone to overinterpreting stimuli in the body as being dangerous or stressful. But if you have the kind of a childhood that everybody has to varying degrees, um, particularly if you've had a um, abusive childhood, emotionally, physical, or sexual, though, or if you've had a lot of physical trauma to the body or a lot of surgeries or a lot of interactions with physicians, with each interaction, your limbic system is looking at your environment, internal and external, of, hmm, the world you live in isn't very safe. So I, as your limbic system, I need to protect you. And I'm gonna protect you by scrutinizing the stimuli that you're exposed to, and I'm not gonna let you do anything. So we're usually dealing with a somewhat compromised limbic system. And if we add to that mold toxicity, now we have a limbic system that is really hurting. and in an attempt to protect us, it will overreact to everything. So a lot of our patients will become overly sensitive to every stimulus you can imagine. Light, sound, touch, chemicals, food, EMF, everything. And we will become emotionally uh, mood swings. Our emotions will fluctuate. So that's an integral part of this mold toxicity. You can't ignore it, and you can, but that would not be a healthy thing to do. It affects us spiritually. And one way of looking at spirituality is by asking the question, what gives your life meaning and purpose? And when you're as sick as most of the people that I see are, life doesn't have much meaning and purpose. I mean, we get up in the morning and I feel awful and I struggle to take a shower and I go back to bed because that's so exhausting and I'm, I'm anxious and I'm depressed and I hurt and my joints hurt and I can't think straight and I've got such fatigue and we overlay that with the emotional impact and the spiritual impact of not being able to do what gives us meaning and purpose and we are off to the races in the wrong direction. Thank you. That's never heard it 
explained exactly that way. It's it brings a lot of clarity to you know how it affects the limbic system, the vagus nerve, et cetera. Um, thank you so much for that. And um, I know a lot of people out there are probably um, struggling with, you know, mold, mycotoxin, other types of, you know, chronic chronic issues. I think you mentioned chronic infections, mast cell, et cetera. Um, but for mold and mycotoxin specifically, um, what resources do you recommend, whether they're books or online resources and things that that, you know, for people to kind of start learning more about this, because, you know, we know that we all need to educate ourselves on this. Well, first of all, I've written more about it than anybody I can think of. So my books. Um, there you go. There you I, go. I, well, I, I don't want this to be self-serving. Um, my book, Toxic, subtitled Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivity, and Other Environmental Illnesses, really covers this broadly and in quite a bit of what I hope will be practical and useful detail. If you want to read that much, I have an ebook which I updated last year that's called Mold and Mycotoxins Current Evaluation and Treatment 2022. And it's a 40 page ebook which will go over mold toxicity specifically for both patients and their families so you don't have that much to read. Um, Great. If, re if reading is an issue, which it is for a lot of my patients, because they're cognitively impaired, uh, toxic does come as an audio book. And a lot of my patients have found that to be helpful. So nice. those are two references. For those people who've gone, gotten unusually sensitized, which I mentioned, I have a new book, which has just been written. And we're currently looking at going to press, hopefully be out by late spring or summer, tentatively called, Why Is My Body So Sensitive? and what to do about it, where we describe, I've got a great group of authors that have combined to write the book with me. It's just, I don't think anything like it's ever been written, really helping those people who've gotten sensitive, many of whom have been uh, dismissed and trivialized by the medical profession to realize this is very real and we can treat it. So I, I'm excited about that. Uh, looking forward to reading that as well as an integrated clinician. So thank you in advance for, for writing that. Um, what is one thing you wish everyone knew about mold and mycotoxins? Just to kind of sum up uh, for, for people, kind of a little bit of a take home here. Well, first of all, everything we've talked about today is treatable. So that if you have this, this is treatable. Um, this can be cured and fixed for the vast majority of people who have it. So I wanna leave you with a message of hope. Um, second, the number one thing is to make the diagnosis, meaning to look at the complex symptoms that you or a loved one or friend has and go, oh, did we ever think about mold toxicity as the cause? Because it is missed so often. There are so many suffering people in this country who could be helped if they knew what was wrong with them. So if you have a weird, wild collection of symptoms that make no sense, even to doctors that you've been to, think mold. I, I do have a follow-up question on that. Um, on the kind of the typical national lab tests that, that we look at for things like chronic inflammatory uh, response syndrome, things like TGF-beta, um, I know C4A, you know, can be good at, at different labs, but are, are you using any of those um, kind of blood work tests in your practice as an adjunct to the urine mycotoxin test? Or are you doing more of the urine testing? Um, to me, the urine test is way more specific. It gives me a blueprint by knowing what's there. So it is far and away the best test. There are other tests, which we call inflammatory markers. Um, as you mentioned, there's C4A, TGF-beta-1, MMP-9, VEGF. Um, they will tell you that there's inflammation going on here, but they won't distinguish the cause. So if you get those back and they're elevated, it tells you, yep, you're inflamed, but it doesn't tell you how. So it could be mold, it could be chlamydia, it could be the wide variety of things will elevate those particular tests. So um, I used them in the very beginning before we had the urine tests. 
now that the urim tests are available i don't use them anymore because again cost becomes important and um, if i if i'm going to ask a patient to spend i want them to get the test that will really show me what we've got and how to treat it all in one test yeah yeah thank you so much um and Dr. Nathan, thank you so much for coming on today and spending some time with us and educating us on mold and mold toxicity and kind of some of the things to look out for to, to make that diagnosis and to really start addressing this, which, like you said, 10 million people, that's that's quite a lot of people, most of which have no idea that this is what's causing their symptoms and their issues. So, uh, Dr. Nathan, how can listeners learn more about you and work with you? If you could just kind of comment on that, that would be great. Um, sure. My website is pretty simple to get to. It's simply neilnathanmd.com. Okay. And there's plenty of information there. Um, I, I'm not treating people anymore. Um, after 50 years in practice, I retired about two years ago, but I'm still consulting, as you know. Yes. So um, I'm working with other physicians with their complicated patients, and I'm happy to consult um, with another physician and their patient to help them get at the nitty gritty details and help them to heal. Well, thank you so much. And definitely for listeners, check out Dr. Nathan's book, Toxic. It's really an amazing book for both patients and clinicians, I would say, people that are interested in learning about mold and how to detox in general. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nathan, for coming on today. and. Uh, We'll talk soon. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us today. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to leave us a review. It helps our podcast to reach more listeners. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our next episodes and conversations. And thank you so much again for being with us.